Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Stern, and I'm the founder and president of the Endowment for Middle East Truth. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this Dr. Miriam and Sh Sheldon Adelson um, Policy Seminar. What we're going to be discussing today is a topic that very few people have the courage to discuss. We are going to be discussing the communities that are in the territories that Israel was forced to capture in 1967. But before I go into that, I first want to thank Melody Devine of the, Con of the Office of Congressman Doug Lamborn, who arranged for this policy seminar today. Thank you. So as we know, um, the settlers are the one group of people that everyone loves to demonize. The settlers are the group of people that many, many folks would like to say are the main obstacle between peace in the Middle East, as though Sunnis and Shiites would sit down and love one another if the settlers weren't there, and peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Um, the United States and the international community is constantly engaged in a discussion about the future of a two-state solution and the question of Israeli settlements and whether there can ever be peace between Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, so there is just one group of people that has been greatly impacted um, by these discussions um, that don't re really receive any opportunities to express their point of view. The settlers who are living in Yudan Shamron or Judean Samaria are what is commonly referred to as the West Bank. Um, even worse, this group has been singled out for demonization across the board, <coughs> blamed for obstructing the peace process and subjected to a host of vilifications. Um, Ahmet is very, very proud to be able to host today Rabbi Yishai Fleischer. Rabbi Fleischer is an international spokesman for the Jewish community of Hebron, or Hebron, a city with a rich historical Jewish past, and which is home to many holy places, uh, most notably the Cave of the Patriarch, and the Cave of the Patriarchs. Um, Yishai will share the legal, historical, and moral narrative for the Jewish communities of Yudan Shemron are what's commonly referred to as the West Bank. His unique, on-the-ground perspective gives a rare glimpse into the day-to-day -day lives of the Jews living here. Um, Rabbi Fletcher will also discuss topics concerning current concepts in Israeli law and tending to address issues of land ownership, housing rights, voting rights, and citizenship. Um, Mishai is the international spokesperson for the Jewish community of Hebron. He's been featured on CNN, Al Jazeera, Fox, Vice, and many more stations. He's also an Israeli broadcaster and a frequent columnist for major news and, um, and analysis for websites, including Breitbart, um, Jerusalem Post, Israel Hayom, and others. He holds a law degree from Cardozo Law School and a rabbinical ordination from Kalal Agudat Akin. Yishai serves as a, served as a paratrooper um, and they all, or still serves, as a paratrooper in the all-elite IDF battlefield reserve. He speaks Hebrew, English, and Russian, and lives on the Mount of Olives in eastern Jerusalem. Um, Uri, Rabbi Uri Kazan is the Director General of the Jewish Community of Hebron. Um, he made Aliyah, a move to Israel, 35 years ago um, to Hebron from Chicago. He served in several public positions, including head of security and chief paramedic of the Hebron region. He's married to Shelley, has five children, and a growing number of grandchildren. So without further ado, it's my supreme honor and privilege to introduce you to Rabbi Yishai Fletcher. Thank you so much for coming in today. I think it's really fun to have uh, this, this large group. And I think the reason you're here is because we want to discuss things that are oftentimes uh, people are afraid to discuss them. They don't want to get into them. Uh, we're going to be at APAC, myself and the Director General Rory Karzan who's here. And at APAC, we looked at the agenda. There's not a lot of talks about this humongous issue, this elephant in the room, which is the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, or the settlements. You want to call it whatever you want to call it. You want to call it the West Bank, or Judea and Samaria. You want to talk about occupation, or you want to talk about ancestral rights. 
All those are good, but let's talk about the issues. And I'm guessing that the people that are in the room today are people that want to talk about it or hear about it. I want to thank so much Sarah Stern from Emmett and this amazing team at Emmett uh, who uh, really make things happen here every day. It's a lot of fun and, and uh, it's a great opportunity to begin our connection. Uh, and also Melody, thank you so much for making it happen here from uh, Congressman Lamborn. And of course, uh, our Director General is here as well. And if you want nitty gritty answers, he's, he's here to, uh, to answer those things as well. So, uh, I'm, I'm a very lucky man or unlucky man, whichever way you, you look at it. I live on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, but it's in the broader community of Ras El Amud. It's an Arab community on the Mount of Olives. And it's a, a community that is oftentimes, it faces attacks from the jihadist, uh, uh, people who have accepted, Arabs who have accepted the jihadist ideology. Um, and I travel from the Mount of Olives, and I see the Temple Mount in my window, you know, the Golden Dome. I see it in my window, and I travel to Hebron almost every day. So I'm lucky because I think I'm living in the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people. Uh, and I'm lucky because I get to be next to the Temple Mount, which is a, a historical and important place for the Jewish people. And certainly in Hebron, Hebron, which is where the uh, cradle of Jewish civilization, really monotheistic civilization, begins. That's where, if you don't know, we'll talk about in a second, the matriarchs and the, and the patriarchs of the Bible are buried, according to the Bible. Uh, but I'm not lucky because for my wife, it means that I that she thinks to herself, uh, my husband is going to be traveling in some dangerous places. And in fact, they are more dangerous. There are some people who want to tell you, no, they're not dangerous at all. There's no problem here whatsoever. But it, there, there are dangerous involved. And that's because uh, there is uh, some peoples who have accepted the idea that Jewish people don't belong in what was, what was known once as Judea, that they don't belong in the ancestral Jewish homeland, and are fighting very hard uh, to try to destroy our presence there and to try to scare us. Okay? There may be other narratives uh, that, that you have heard of or, or, uh, or believe in. We can discuss this throughout. Before we begin, we're, we're going to use Hebron as a kind of um, litmus test, a kind of uh, case study in Jewish connection to places in Judea and Samaria. That's why, that's why I represent today. And it's really one of the, it's, it's kind of the jewel in the crown of the Judean Samaria movement, the settlement movement. And uh, it's got five points, really. So let's go through it. First, the, 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 the topic is that Jews have been in Hebron since antiquity. Why is that important? Because what I want to prove to you in the next few slides is that you may think, or you've been, maybe you've heard the idea that Jewish people are Johnny come lately to Judea and Samaria, that we've occupied a land, not ours. That we're settlers, meaning to say we're somehow foreign to this land. That is part of a narrative that has been drawn. The narrative has been drawn that Jewish people are a white people from Europe who have come in the last, since 1948, and have taken over other people's land. That is a narrative. And we all remember uh, the White House uh, reporter, Helen Thomas, remember what she said? Jews go back home. Where's home? It's Poland, it's Germany, it's, it's America, but certainly not Palestine. That is the narrative that's weaved. So let's go through it uh, quickly. That's myself. I just wanted to get a shot of myself into the slideshow. And, uh, that's myself in the right with my friend Jeremy, who actually works in, in the Knesset of Israel. And this is basically just, you know, this is what it looks like today, the tomb of the patriarchs and the matriarchs. And we'll get to, to, the, to the importance of this building in a second. All right, the, the, year, the, the number of years is 3,800 is the technical uh, number. And that is the Jewish people's ancestral burial grounds are found in Hebron. Meaning to say the fathers and the mothers of the Jewish people are found in Hebron. One time uh, there was a protest by Shalom Achshav, Peace Now, in, in, in Hebron, and they were there saying the Jews don't belong in Hebron. And I came to Hebron to protest their protest with a simple sign that said, Abba Kavur Po, Father is buried here. Yeah. That's it, that, I didn't write anything else. Not you're bad, we're right. This, father is buried here. You don't have to accept that I'm, that I have, that, that it's a good idea for me to be here. But you have to accept that I'm, I have an ancestral connection to this land. So 3,800 years ago, Abraham began burying the Jewish founders, Sarah and Hebron, and the rest of the fathers and mothers, except for Rachel, are buried uh, um, in Hebron. You, you all know this face, King David, right? Well, according to the Bible, 3,000 years ago, King David established his kingdom there. He, he established the kingdom there, according to the mystical tradition of Judaism, because he had to kind of nurture from the forefathers who were buried there. He wanted to start. Then he moved, of course, to 
Jerusalem, right? That's where King David's capital is. But he starts 3,000 years ago in Hebron. Now, this is a very important thing. Uh, what I told you just a minute ago are, are biblical you know, uh, narrative stories. You may agree with them, and you may not agree with them. Right? You may believe in the Bible or not. We have found from the first temple era, from, from a little bit after King David, we have found a thousand of these seals. A thousand, not one. And they bear an inscription in ancient Hebrew. It said it's the same Hebrew, but just a different alphabet. And it says to the king of Hebron. We found a thousand of these things in our language. From our people from 3,000 years ago. Now, 2,000 years ago, this building was built. Okay, it was built by a Jewish king for a Jewish purpose. This building is, have you been there? Has anybody been there? Wow, that's a lot, but less than half. Uh, this building is, have you been to the Taj Mahal? I have not either. But this, this, this building is, in a sense, the Taj Mahal of, of the Bible. Uh, why do I say that? Because uh, it, it's a mausoleum built by a Jewish king, a little wild. His name is King Herod. And he built this building approximately the same time that he built the second temple. We have the same type of stones. There's a specific type of Herodian stone that, that, that was at the base of this building, uh, which you know immediately that it's built in the same way the temple was built in Jerusalem. And he built it for a Jewish purpose, which is to commemorate the, the, the uh, tombs that are there. How do you call the place in Hebrew? Ma'at HaMachpelah. Ma'at HaMachpelah, the Ma'atanach. The Chuk, the Absolutely. The King Herod. No, no, no. Ma'at, the Ma'ara. This a nice lady is asking a, a correct question. She says, well, the tomb of the patriarchs is, comes way before this building. That's correct. Herod builds a mausoleum on top of these caves to make sure that everybody knows where they are. He, like, beautifies it. Same thing as he does with the temple itself. There was a temple atop a mount much earlier, but he makes it beautiful. Good question. Okay, I, I'm sorry, this may be not the greatest shot of this beautiful thing, but we have found, really relatively recently, uh, second temple ritual baths uh, in Hebron. And these are, only Jews were making ritual baths at that time, and these ritual baths were there in order for the, right next door to it, behind, at the, at the kind of back of the picture, there's actually wine presses and olive presses. Now the reason that's important is because the Jewish people, the way they used to do it is that they used to dunk in a ritual bath to purify themselves before they would get to work of the wine. The wine would be served at the temple. And so therefore you had to serve it in purity. Okay, so we have found a whole, what, what would be today a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, industrial. industrial area, industrial zone. Okay, but at the heart of it is this uh, ritual bath, very deep, very big. And Uri has taken pictures of this ritual bath as it's also filled up with snow. So you can guess that the workers there on, on, a, on a wintry day would have to go down to really cold water uh, uh, and that would have been funny to see it. But the point is, is, that, is that this proves uh, uh, unequivocally that Jewish people participated in a life of heaven during the Second Temple and were part of what the Bible calls the wine country, creating that wine for the Temple. Now we've got to skip forward a little bit. So that was, I gave you 4,000, 3,000, 2,000. About 1,000 years ago, the great uh, scholar Maimonides visits Hebron. Why is, it, why is it important? Because he writes, I left Jerusalem for Hebron to kiss the graves of my forefathers in the cave of Machpelah. And on that very day, I stood at the cave and I prayed. I'm just trying to show you that the continuity of the Jewish people's relationship to this place went from 4,000, 3,000, 2,000. Now, 1,000 years ago, and 500 years ago, you remember 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. That's a nice part of 1492. The other part is that there was a Spanish uh, Inquisition and, and, and a fiction of the Jews. Many of those Jews end up in Hebron, and they invigorate the community and make it very beautiful. This is the Avram Avinu synagogue, which was built in 1540. And this building is exactly a Spanish architecture, and it's uh, people that leave in 1492, end up in Hebron, and end up building this building. Uh, this building is rebuilt and recreated, and we'll talk about why it had to be built, rebuilt later. <coughs> okay, and I want to keep, sh keep showing you that the history keeps going. This is Beit Hadassah, uh, built in 1893. It was the first hospital in the land of Israel, and it gave medical care to both Jews and Arabs. The year there is 1893. Right? Today there's a, there are beautiful museums at the bottom of the people who live there. These are proofs of our land purchases in the 1800s. We have the paperwork. It's not a theory. Uh, it's not like we came in now and, and we're you know, making things up. We have the paperwork. This is Turkish paperwork to prove that, that we own 
on that property. There was also Chabad, we all know Chabad, my, my, one of my moms saw my slideshow, she said, you gotta talk about Chabad, because everybody knows Chabad. And of course Chabad uh, um, has property that they purchased there, and one of the great, actually the great female, she's almost, she was considered the great uh, righteous person, and, and not a rabbi, but, but a female rabbi of sorts, uh, kind of patron saint of Hebron, her name was uh, Menucha Rachel, and she's buried there. Uh, uh, the, with the advent of, uh, of a kind of rebuilt Zionism, more people come in. In 1925, Big Yeshiva is established there, and it lasts for only four years. And we'll talk. We'll get back to that in just one second. So, on all that, I tried to show you one simple thing, and this is what I what I spoke with with uh, a, a group of Reform rabbis that just came in to Hebron. I was very proud that they came in. A lot of people don't come in because of fear. But, but I said to the reform rabbis, men and women, I said to them, listen, we can talk about if it's a good idea for Jews to be there. But the impulse of the Jewish people's relationship to Hebron is it's an, it's a historical impulse. It's from antiquity. <coughs> and if you, you may have a problem with what we're doing there today, but you can't say that we're just, there's no reason that we're there. We've always been there. We learn to be there. We continue to be there. But in 1929, things changed. I showed you a big kind of uh, uh, historical uh, uh, train that, that led normally to normal life. But in 1929, there was a horrible pogrom riot. Well, for 700 years under Islamic rule, Jews were not actually allowed to go into that Jewish building called the Tomb of the Patriarchs. They were only allowed to go into the seventh step. But that shows you that there was a milieu of anti-Jewish anti attitudes already from, from, uh, from 700 years ago. But that was stirred up finally in 1929 when the Jewish community was destroyed. Uh, there was a jihadist massacre that, that killed 67 Jews. This is that synagogue that I showed you before. And it was this man on the left, uh, you, you, you probably know the man on the right, that's not, uh, that's not Sarah Silverman, that's uh, actually uh, uh, Hitler there, but on the left side uh, is the Grand Mufti, uh, Hajimin al-Husseini, and he was, he was an anti-Semite of the first degree, and he was a Nazi collaborator. And he stirred up these riots in Jerusalem and in Hebron that killed uh, 67 people. The British are in charge back then. Right, this is one of, the souls, one of the few survivors of this family. Um, the British authorities are in place in, in Hebron at that time, and you know what they decide? We can't protect the Jews, and they kick out the Jews out of Hebron. 1967, here's the question. Is 1967 liberation or occupation? Okay? Which one is it? If we're a foreign people, having nothing to do with this land, then we're in occupation. But if you believe the narrative that I weave, that I don't expect you to believe it, you can challenge it, you can disagree with it. But that is the big question. Today we hear the word occupation over and over again. That, that, that word means that, you, that, that word presupposes that we're foreigners in this land. So there's Rabbi Gorin on the left side, there's the, the, he, that's in Hebron. On the right side, certainly you've seen this picture before, this is the paratroopers liberating or capturing the Western world. Depends on how you see it. Today's Jewish community resides mostly in those homes that were Jewish before 1929. I hope these pictures are helpful to you because they're really giving you trying to kind of sense of what it looks like there. All right, do you remember that beautiful synagogue that I showed you before? That's what it looked like when we came back after 19... Uh, okay, there was one piece of history that was skipped here, and that was 1929, the big massacre. 1948, Jordan conquers. And they make sure no Jews come there, and they're starting to destroy Jewish history in places like the old city of Jerusalem. There were great synagogues there. They were dynamited and dropped. And the Jewish cemetery in Hebron destroyed on purpose. Why would, why would the jihad or, or, that, or even uh, the Arab nationalism, why would they destroy uh, Jewish markers like that? What's the point of destroying these big synagogues? Well, the point is, is to make you not yearn to come back. The point there is to erase your history. We're having the same thing right now on the Temple Mount, where Jewish history is being systematically destroyed on purpose. There's a, there's a, there, it's, a, it's a kind of Middle Eastern principle. You've seen it now in, uh, what, what was that place called that ISIS destroyed? Palmyra. Palmyra, that's right. And uh, you've seen it also in Iraq, the destruction of historical places. It's, a, it's not coincidental. It's not because artillery lands there. It's because there's an effort to erase history and to replace it. I call it erase and replace. This 
This is that synagogue that I showed you before. That beautiful synagogue? There it is. It was turned into a goat pen. And it was wrecked completely. And we're not going to watch this movie now. Uh, we'll get back to this. Okay, so... Uh, 1967, Jewish people, we said liberation or occupation. Here the Jewish people are back, there you see an actual marathon, a secular marathon that happens next to the tomb of patriarchs and matriarchs in Hebron. So meaning to say, 1967, that's the question. Is it, is it that we occupied it or we came back? Here's part of normal life there. Okay, so 1967, we come back and we settle this, this land, right? But we are still in a war. People like Uri have seen he was the head of security and also uh, one of the medics, the uh, EMTs of, of Hebron, and he has seen a lot of things, a lot of dark things. Why is that? Because the war continues. Though in 1967 we returned, we tried to build, we have faced consistent violence. But we face two kinds of violence, my friends. Two kinds of violence. One is physical violence. That means shootings, killings, Molotov cocktails, rocks, that kind of thing. But we also face what I call a narrative jihad. We face efforts to delegitimize, erase, replace our good name and our rights. Just, uh, this is 1984. Yeshiva student is murdered in Hebron. Twelve Israelis were killed in an ambush. This was about four months after I got married there. This was just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, they captured these uh, uh, two jihadists who were shooting at the tomb of the patriarch and, and uh, injured a, a few soldiers uh, using this uh, uh, handmade gun. This was my friend. His name was Gennady Kaufman. He was, I, I, I had recently gotten the job being the spokesman in Hebron, and I had met him. He was a Russian Jew, a little bit uh, older than me, and just a sweet person, and his whole life was about beautifying the Tomb of the Patriarchs. And I was sitting with Uri in the office when a call came in that said um, somebody's been stabbed, and it turned out to be Gennady, this, this uh, sweet, innocent gardener. Uh, and he was, uh, his life was taken. Um, that is the kind of jihad, that's a physical jihad that I was trying to show you. But now that, that I discuss physical jihad, that's actually the, that's actually one problem that we know how to deal with. Many of the Jews that live in the settlements are armed, we have a great uh, uh, police force, great army force, but there's something that we're not exactly armed against, that's what we kept we doing. Up. And that is that uh, there's terrorism, like you see here, physical terrorism. But there's also narrative terrorism. Okay, look at the, look at the sign there. Take the settlers out of Hebron. Meaning to say, the Jewish people, how many settlers are in Hebron? Any guesses? Any guesses how many Jews live in Hebron, actually? Not many. Not many. Huh? Can you just say that? Did I say over there? Uh, there was a sign. We have about a thousand, about a thousand to eleven hundred, depends on how big the yeshiva is. Yeshiva, they're impermanent, about three hundred students there. There are about a thousand Jews that live in Hebron, with, uh, with also uh, an additional Jewish community right next door called Kiryat Arba, which is about nine thousand people. We have about ten thousand Jews that live in the Hebron region, and about one hundred eighty thousand to two hundred thousand Arabs that live there. Okay? So, Take the settlers out of Hebron, or make it Udenine, is, uh, I think, a very, you know, um, I think it's basically saying, we don't have any rights to live here, we're living amongst you, we're not going to tolerate you. Now here's a problem, a, a Washington, D.C. problem. This is UNESCO. They declared the Tomb of the Machbarah to be a Muslim-only heritage site. Let's take a look at their language. Let's look at the last one, number 37. UNESCO deeply regrets the Israeli refusal to comply with UNESCO decision, which requests Israeli authorities to remove the two Palestinian sites, we're talking about the tomb of Rachel and Hebron, Heb the tomb of Patriarchs, from its national heritage list. It calls on Israel, the occupying power, to act in accordance with the section means to say they want us to not mention Hebron as part of our ancestry, because it's part of Palestinian ancestry. They want us to, this, this is an official document saying you don't, you don't, we don't even want you to mention it. I want to remind you something. 
the Jewish people revolted how many times against the Romans? Right, there was the Great Revolt. Two ways. Right? There was the Great Revolt. That was not a successful revolt. They destroyed the temple. But, but the Jewish people were so uh, 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 stuck at having independence that we revolted against. 135. That's right. That's called the Bar Kokhba Revolt. And the Bar Kokhba Revolt, uh, as opposed to what a lot of people think, were actually successful. That's why we have Bar Kokhba coins. They were successful. For three years, we took control of Jerusalem. But Herod comes back with a vengeance. And not Herod, excuse me, but Hadrian comes back with a vengeance. And the reason that Hadrian, the way that Hadrian is going to come back with a vengeance, he's not going to just kill Jews, because he knows that that's not enough, because they're going to keep coming back, they're like the lizard's tail. Do you know what he's going to do? He's going to rename Israel. He's going to go Syria, Palestina. Remember the old Star, Star Wars movies? These are not the droids you're looking for, okay? This is not the Israel that you're looking for. Jerusalem is renamed Ayola Capitolina. This is not the Jerusalem you're looking for. Okay? And so UNESCO is using that same tactic. Tactic. This is not the Hebron you're looking for. It was never a Jewish Hebron. It's always been Muslim heritage, Palestinian heritage, and this uh, well-respected international organization wants to take away. <laughs> it's UNESCO. They decide on World Heritage Sites. I love that. <laughs> Let's talk after this. <laughs> Nobody knows that. <laughs> okay, this is the tomb of Joseph in a completely different town called Shechem. Okay, the tomb of Joseph. Joseph is carried from Egypt uh, by his brothers, uh, by, by the children of Israel, and he's buried in Shechem, his lot inheritance. Uh, it was a Jewish site, but it has been destroyed. This is exactly what we believe what would happen if, you remember that slide that I showed you, take the settlers out of Hebron? Take the settlers out of Hebron, this is what you're going to get with the Tomb of the Patriarchs, okay? So that's what we call the Tomb of the Patriarchs and Matriarchs. Without the Jews, the Tomb of Joseph. That's what's going to happen to it. He gets destroyed, he gets ransacked, and it looks much worse than it even looks in this picture. All right, as the PA, the Palestinian Authority, were in total control of Hebron, it would be inaccessible, just like the Tomb of Joseph in Shechem. This is, uh, I offer this to you as a theory, you don't have to accept it. I write here that the root of violence is not the settlements, nor the occupation. All these things are just a pretext. Violence in Hebron is rooted in a prevailing jihadist, supremacist ideology, which rejects the sovereignty of inferior, inferior peoples. My friends, I, have not, I do not use the term Arabs when I talk about who's challenging our rights in Hebron. I don't use that term. We have many Arab friends, colleagues, and people who think very differently. What I'm talking about here is the jihad. It's not a race. It's not a people's. It's an ideology. You can accept it or not accept it. It happens to be that Muslim Arabs are susceptible to jihadist ideology because it builds on their cultural and religious foundational ideas. But the jihad itself is a supremacist ideology. It's not supremacist just against Jews. We all know what's going on right now. Christians, non-Muslims, Yazidis. There's two kinds of minorities in the Middle East. Two kinds, armed and unarmed. Okay, the Kurds, the Jews, they're armed. And therefore they survive. Yazidis, Copts, Christians, other minorities, there's many other, okay, in Iran, in Iraq, all kinds of other minorities. If you're not strong, you get wiped out. That's because jihadism is not against the Jews. It's not a Jewish problem. I think you in the United States of America are starting to understand that jihadism is not just a Jewish and Israeli problem. Okay, we're getting to, towards the end here. Let's just talk about one thing which is very important for everybody to understand, because you may get a different presentation here one day, and you have to know it at least from this perspective. That's one truth that you have to know. All right, here's the truth about Hebron. 1997, Hebron Accords, what happens is, is that Hebron is divided into two sections. And that is, 80% is going to be controlled by the Palestinians, H1, and 20% is going to be controlled by the IDF. Israelis are barred from the Palestinian side of Hebron. Barred. Like you're not allowed to go there. It's got many important Jewish sites there. Now, look at this map very carefully. This map is so important. This map is, this is, if I had to show you one slide today about not the history, but about the reality today, this is the slide that you have to see. The reason you have to see the slide and that nice little eagle is, is, uh, is uh, let's leave the eagle alone. Okay. Uh, do you see that, that 
that bluish part up there? Yeah. That is Jewish Hebron. I said to you before that, that IDF controls 20%, correct? Yeah. But it only controls that in order to protect that 3% that Jews live in. Jews live in 3% of Hebron. That is the actual truth in man. The rest, there's the 20% up there to the right, which is IDF controlled, but Arabs live there. And to the left, H1, is a huge Arab Hebron. And we're going to see pictures of it in a second, which is large, successful. And so therefore, once you get that picture, if you, if you, keep, you know what, keep this, keep this map in your mind. Let's keep going, just keep this map in your mind, please. Okay. Okay, so now there's a big protest on your way called Open Shuhada, Shuhada Street. Shuhada Street means from the word Shahid or Shahada, which means, uh, it actually means the word, the word actually means bear witness. Uh, that a person who blows himself up or whatever, or dies on the name of, of Jihad, he bears witness to the truth of Allah. Okay, so they've named the little street that we live on, we're going to see it in a second, that one street, that corridor, we call it King David Street, they call it Shuhada Street. Okay, so they say open it up. And there's a reason why they say open it up. There's a reason. It's not totally incorrect. Let's understand what's going on. What is it? ISM stand for? ISM is International Solidarity Movement. It's one of the... Uh, I just want to thank Congressman Jen Lambert for coming and for arranging for all of this. She's a dear, dear friend. Thank you so much. Thank you for honoring uh, our uh, discussion here today. We were just again, we went through the basic the history of, uh, of uh, Jewish Hebron. Uh, the, the, the reason that the Jewish people are uh, connected to Hebron today is from 4,000 years ago. Abraham, we said 3,000 years ago, King David, 2,000 years ago, the two of the patriarchs, 500 years ago. And I've been there. That's right. Oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> because, because being there makes all the difference. When you see it for yourself, uh, you understand what's really bad. And actually, I'm, I'm trying to, with the sludge, I'm trying to bring people there a little bit. Yes, yes. And we just got to a section talking about the truth of what's going on in Hebron. And we have here a slide <coughs> that says, Open Shuhada Street. And these folks are marching it. This is from the ISM, the International Solidarity Movement. It's an organization that uh, really tries to undermine Jewish rights in Hebron uh, and in other places in, in Judea and Samaria. And what they're saying here, these signs, open the street that's closed. And I was saying, yes, there's a truth to what they're saying. There's a street that's closed. There is a street that's closed in Hebron. And we showed a map right now how much, how many Jews actually live in Hebron and where they're located. I showed a map that said that only three percent of Hebron is actually Jewish, uh, or where Jewish people live, and that street, which we call King David Street, they call Shuadah Street, is actually mostly closed to Arab traffic. Let's take see some pictures of that. Right, so the, the Supreme Court, in conjunction with the IDF, ordered certain restrictions due to numerous terrorist attacks, including <coughs> booby trap teddy bears, uh, and the murder of a pregnant mother named Dina Levy, and her husband Guy in 2003, that's the parents. Here's a picture of, Shu of Shuhada Street, or King David Street. This street is closed to a lot of air traffic, but it is one kilometer long within a giant Hebron. And uh, you may not be able to understand that from the propaganda that you hear. Why? Because what they do is like this. I see this happen all the time. A lot of press comes in, and the street is closed. In fact, there's many Arab stores on this one street that are closed. And what the photographer will do is like this. There's a soldier, an Israeli soldier with a gun. And behind him are some, some stores that are closed. He'll wait until a young Jewish boy with like sidewalk or something walks by. Snap. That's the picture. The picture is Arab stores are closed. There's a strong military presence. The settlers are there. Well, there's, 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 there's a truth there, right? There is a street that's closed. But it's closed for security purposes as opposed to a giant free Hebron, which we're going to see pictures of it, of how much actual life there is. Uh, in Hebron. Here's, here's a picture of a soccer field in, in a different part of Hebron. I said before, this street, King David Street, is one kilometer long. Let's take a, let's take a look at pictures of Hebron, which maybe the congressman saw. Hebron has a thriving economy of 17,000 factories. Shopping malls, three universities, four hospitals. Here's a picture of Hebron. That is Arab Hebron. I have never been there. I see that picture, that image, from, uh, from that one kilometer long strip. I've never been to this part of Hebron. And I've never eaten here. Right? 
There it is. Look at that. There is KFC head run. Do you see that? American capitalism. <laughs> now, look, look at this KFC. It's you know, look at the happy smiley faces. Millions served. But be, you know, before I went kosher, I used to go to KFC. Best coleslaw, right? And 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 here it is in Hebron. So remember that photo, that picture I showed you? Open Shahada Street. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the the Arab child cannot get to his school. Uh, I don't get to see my brother who lives on the other side of the street or whatever it is. These are all conflations of a, of a security truth, an unpleasant, lamentable, we regret it, that we have to close down those stores, but it was for our safety so we can continue to exist there. So one kilometer long street, this is the rest of Hebron. Look at the picture to the left. It's exactly what it looks like. Here's another vantage point of more of the uh, old city of Jerusalem, of, uh, of Hebron. Um, Arab Hebron is a thriving city, but its images has been falsified to fit an agenda. To say that it is being, uh, that the Jewish people are, 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 are subduing the local population, that they're settling, disrupting lives, that is the agenda that we hear all the time. Okay. Uh, sometimes you'll hear Jewish speakers come to Congress, and talk a lot of negativity, and we're crying a lot because we have these problems and jihad is attacking us. Let me tell you, I represent some of the bravest people I know. People who put their life on the line. But not only do we put our life on the line and are willing to fight the bad guys, we also have a vision for peace. We have a vision for peace. In fact, I think we actually have a vision for sustainable and true peace. It's not going to come through weakness and through retreating, in my opinion. It's going to come through strength. So, Hebron, you see those great those are great vines, and the, the, the Bible talks about Hebron region, region being a, a, a grapevine region. Continues to be that way today. It's normalized. Here's A.E. Pie came in the other uh, a few weeks ago. A.E. Pie came in. I thought it was very important to take this picture because uh, what 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 we see this is it's normative. First thing, these are young Jews, but they're not necessarily religious Jews. They know their heritage. They're connected to the uh, ancestral heritage of this place. They understand that it's a uh, is a heritage site. A great shot. It makes me very happy to see this picture. Okay, as I said, in, in the Hebron region, we have 10,000 Jews that live there, and they're determined to stay forever. That's a way. I myself got married uh, right there as well. It wasn't as fancy because at the time when I got married, it wasn't it wasn't yet like a, a normal thing to get married. There. One of the very important things that I tell people all the time is you don't have to agree that the Jewish people have a right to be here. You don't even have to agree to our history. But you have to understand that that's how we self-identify. You have to understand that that's how we see the narrative. We see our story as being here, connected from the past to, the, to eternity. And if you're going to argue with us, argue from this point of view. To the right there, you see Noam Arnon, uh, our kind of legendary spokesperson, who I get the privilege to work with. And to the left, we have... Let's go back to that slide if possible. One second. One second. We have uh, Sheikh. Well, anyway, let me, let, I'll just discuss that last slide. We have Sheikh Jabri. That was an important slide, right? I wanted you to see the Jews and Arabs actually sit together and, and, and talk. This happens. This happens all the time. In fact, it happens clandestinely. I was recently in such an event. We had an Arab Sheikh, sheikh sitting with us, and what was he talking about? How the hell are we going to get rid of the PA? How are we going to get rid of Hamas? I don't want my children to go in line of this jihad. I don't want them to try to destroy Israel. What do I want? I want a decent life. And how am I going to get a decent life? It's not going to be through the corrupt Palestinian Authority. That's not going to give me a decent life. That's been tested. It's been tested. It's a theory? No, it's been tested in practice. And it's fair. How am I going to get a decent and normal life? I'm going to get it under Israel. A stronger and bigger Israel will give me that normal life. And moreover, where are we at? There are many Arabs who are looking for alternatives to the PA and to the Jihad. And some of them, like the Sheikh, also thinks it's an Islamic commandment to respect the Jewish people's return to the land of Israel. There are phrases in the Quran that talk about the Jewish people's return to the land of Israel and that the Jewish people are special and holy. There are other phrases in the Quran. But some of these voices, some of these lone voices, want to get up and say, even within Islam itself, there are ideas to respect the Jewish right to the land of Israel. I asked a sheikh that I will not mention here, 
I don't know everybody that's here. And this person asked me not to reveal his name at the time. I said to him, have you heard stories that in 1948, when the Jewish people started uh, winning in the Independence War, and many Arabs ran, did you ever... You, we've all heard the narrative that the Jews pushed them out. Did you ever hear this, what I've heard, that Arabs, uh, uh, the elders, what's called the Mukhtars, would tell the young people, don't fight the Jews, Allah is with them. He said, absolutely, I've heard this many times. Allah is with the Jews. Many times when I argue with my Arab interlocutors, and help to sway them away from jihadist thinking, I say to them, look at this Jerusalem, look at this Al-Quds, that's the Arabic way of saying Jerusalem. I said, do you, do you think that we could have developed this by ourselves? How do you think we were able to defeat you in wars? Six armies against our, our one army? Is it because we're bigger than you? Is it because we're stronger than you? Is it because we're smarter than you? He said, it's me Allah. <laughs> Allah has given us this, this victory, and it says it in your Quran. Why don't you submit <coughs> to the will of Allah? And in fact, I was actually, uh, uh, during uh, the last Gaza war, I was in Al Jazeera, which was really fun. Okay, that's where real fun happens. And I was on Al Jazeera, and, and they said to me, uh, there's been 3,000, Mr. Fla Rabbi Fleischer, Rabbi, they call me, uh, there's been 3,000 rockets, and only 70 Israelis have been killed. How do you explain such a thing? I said, listen, I've got to take off my journalist hat and put on my rabbi hat. So then Allah, he, he knocks these missiles out of the way. How else do you explain it? You think Hamas doesn't know how to shoot? You think my cousins are stupid? No. You know, there's, there's, there's a blessing there. Now, you can't say that on CNN or something because they'll be like, uh, that has got completely, got completely wacko, right? They want you to talk policy and seriousness. But in, on Al Jazeera, there's another set of language that a lot of Arabs understand today, which is what they see before them. How, how else can you explain that the Jewish people have been successful? But what is the contra to that? There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a problem with what I just said. Do you know what some young Arabs tell me? But you lost the Sinai. But you lost the Gaza Strip. Now we've made war against you. You've lost South Lebanon. Now we have 200,000 rockets trained against you. You've lost parts of Judea and Samaria, like, like Shechem. We destroyed your, 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 uh, your tomb of Joseph. You lost the Temple Mount, more or less. Now you can't pray up there. Exactly. That gives them a, 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 an appetite. Uh, it gives them a, a, how does Prime Minister Netanyahu say, a, 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 a back wind. They, not, what does he call it? We don't, we don't, we don't, right, we don't, yeah. Tell it, that's the one. Right. It, it gives them, it encourages them. And uh, a great activist in Israel, his name is Nadia Matar, recently said, it's not the hopelessness of the Palestinians that is causing, causing the terror. It's the hopefulness of the jihad to destroy Israel that gives them motivation to keep going. If I'm a 13-year-old jihadist, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. A few weeks ago, I was leaving work in Hebron when the chief of security ran right past me. And he was running in the kind of way that we know it means there's action. I said to him, Yoni, what's going on? He says, get in the car, take your camera. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I was just about to go home, oh, man. Uh, so I jump in the car with him in the security vehicle. We, 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 we drive full speed. Does that mean something? Yeah, am, am I going to get pulled off here? Okay. Is there a trap door here? Okay, <laughs> is my time up? So uh, he, uh, he, he drives full speed to the scene. I take out my camera. And within about a minute, after jumping into his car and about to leave home in my normative kind of life, I see a beautiful young Arab girl, 15 years old, Beautifully uh, made up, beautiful socks I noticed on her. Great socks. I have a picture, I don't want to show it to you because what she was doing at the time was writhing in pain because she had been stabbed. She was trying to stab and she had been shot. She came, beautifully dressed, to a soldier, tried to stab him. Soldier recognized the threat, opened fire on her, and she was still alive at the time. Now I have to tell you something. Uh, do you, you've heard the expression blood rolling in the streets? You heard that expression? I saw that with my own eyes. I saw that now twice on Hebron. Blood of, of young jihadists literally falling down the street because they had been shot. This young girl was still alive. A few days later, she, she died. And I was uh, so shocked to see this, this young girl that she had chosen that morning to get dressed in her fine, fine clothes so that, and, and then try to take a life and certainly lose her life. What gives her that motivation? What gives her that... What gives her that idea that, that it's a great way to go today? 
some people want to say it's because she had she had some kind of bad relationship or she's you know some kind of um, what do they call it honor killing thing on the way. The fact is is that she's part of a jihadist milieu, which is telling her that if she goes and stabs a soldier, she's going to be part of a great victory for jihad at the end, and Israel will leave the scene one day, and she'll be part of that. We have to send a signal that's never going to happen. That's never going to happen. You're never going to get it. We're finishing up. I know it's been taking a long time. Here is a picture of Jewish life uh, that's happening in Hebron. There's a wedding canopy. Uh, the word Hebron, the Hebron today, and maybe, maybe some of you came today to discuss the problem of the division of Hebron. Hebron is a divided city, as I showed you. But the word Hebron means chibur, it means friendship, it means connecting together. Maybe one day, maybe one day, uh, uh, people will decide that Hebron will be the beginnings of peace through rec the recognition that the Arabs and the Jews actually have something in common, and that's our forefather Abraham, uh, that they recognize, and they recognize his buried there. Maybe one day the house of Saud will combine with the house of Israel and will beautify uh, Hebron. In the meantime, though, that is not the reality. And we continue to be courageous and continue to be strong to hold on to our ancestral lands. Right? Maybe peace can begin here after all. There you go. So I tried to bring you a little bit of pictures of Hebron, and I'm happy to answer any questions about really uh, the other issues that are involved. This was specifically about Hebron, but the whole Judea and Samaria issue. And of course, the Director General uh, of the community is here with us as well for any real ingredients and questions. Well, you, 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 yeah, you, didn't, you didn't waste any time, did you? You, you got right to it. Because the truth of the matter is, these days, when I deal with groups, all kinds of groups, within five minutes of me trying to explain our relationship to Hebron, the question doesn't any more center on Jewish Hebron. It centers around the future of two states, the future of Judea and Samaria, the future of the West Bank, the future of the Palestinian Authority. These are all different words to connote the same kind of thing. Just what is going to happen with this territory? And here in the United States, we hear the reprieve that the only solution is the two-state solution. It's the only solution. We hear it over and over and over again. Refrain. You know, some, huh? Refrain. We hear the refrain. Refrain. Not refrain. Refrain. That's it. Yeah. Again, I've been hanging out in Israel too long. Um, we hear the refrain uh, over and over again that the two-state solution is the only solution. And any, anytime anybody tells me that something is the only one, I'm already doubtful. But when it comes to the two-state solution, it is a proven failure. A recurring and proven failure. Land giveaway, negotiated land giveaway, unilateral land giveaway has only been disastrous for Israel. So the question is now, what's next? What's next? And the first thing that's next is things like this, where at least we're asking what's next. I like the question. The question is already in a very healthy moment. Just to say, well, what's next? How are we going to deal with it? This is a question that even at APAC, which we're coming to, they're afraid to touch which is what's next with Judea and Samaria. What's next? Or with the West Bank, or however you want to put it. You have to ask, what's next? I'll give you very quickly five alternative solutions that are being discussed. This is very important in terms of policy. Okay? And sometimes I don't want Israeli really leaders need a little bit of nudging to understand that we have to stop stalling and start talking about what's next. There's no question that Israel has done everything but annex Judea and Samaria. We've put in 400,000 400, Jews have moved in voluntarily. <coughs> we have helped create those communities. We have Israeli electricity, Israeli water, Israeli buses, Israeli taxes, Israeli security in these places. We've done everything. We've, we, 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 the, the ring has been given. The bride's engaged. But we haven't gone all the way with, with making with full annexation. But that's the next step. Now, how do we do that? Because there's a problem of many Arabs in this place, and there's a problem Israelis are afraid, Israeli leaders are afraid to give them full democratic rights. What are some of the solutions? A few years, I'll give you five solutions quickly. A few years ago, uh, uh, Rabbi Benny Alon and, um, and uh, Arya Eldad came up with something called the Jerusalem is Palestine I Jordan. Jordan is Palestine. <laughs> It's not there, you know. Uh, uh, Jerusalem is Palestine. Jordan is Palestine. Jerusalem is not Palestine. That's where I live and where some people want to claim that it's Palestine. Jordan is Palestine. What is that? It means that Jordan is an 80% Palestinian country. Let them have, let Palestinians that live in the West Bank have the vote, citizenry, in citizenship in Jordan. It's a stay under an annexed Israel 
as residents in their homes with uh, civil rights, but vote their full democratic rights in Amman. We need to say they're like a uh, American who's living in Paris. You live in Paris, you get the rights of, of, of France, but civil rights of France, but you get to vote in America. Okay, you're like an expat. Okay, that's, that's one example. The only problem with that is that we have to force another country to do what we want. Who knows what's going to happen in Jordan? It's basically artificially held up right now, buoyed probably by Israeli security. Aid, okay? But so, somehow it continues to be, who knows if it's not going to be taken over by ISIS at, 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 at any moment or some kind of other Palestinian revolution, and who knows what's going to be there. In any case, Jordan is Palestine is number one. The second one is Naftali Bennett. Uh, education, education Minister, he says, listen, continue the Oslo process to its logical conclusion. The next area C, that's where 400,000 Jews are actually living in Judea and Samaria. There's only about 40,000 Arabs there. And next. And the other areas, well, we don't know. Leave them, maybe it's autonomy or whatever it is, but let's just take the next logical step. Give Israelis rights as Israelis. Let them have normal, normal land purchase rights and other things that we don't have in Judea and Samaria because of this kind of weird quasi status. Give them the normal Israeli status, and the rest we'll figure out later. Number three, Carolyn Glick, great intellectual writer for the Jerusalem Post, has written a book called the the the, uh, the, the, one, the Israel Solution, right? And she's one fantastic. State solution. Huh? One state. The one state solution, and, and what is the one state solution about? Annexation. Annexation. What do you do with the Arabs? Israeli law applies right. to that area, and the Arabs can get Jewish and get Israeli citizenship. There. First, give them civil rights. Give them residency. By the way, uh, how many residents are there in the United States of America non-citizens? About 10 percent. 35 million people live with American civil rights, but not voting rights. It's just an example. It's different, but it's an example that you can live very decently with decent rights uh, without having full voting rights. So she says, and next, give them, give them, uh, give them residency, not full voting rights, immediately with a pathway to citizenship for those people who prove loyalty. If you're not seditious, you don't want to destroy Israel. If you want to live in Israel, we say in Arabic, Ahad al welcome. Come, come live with us. You want to live in our country, we want well-adjusted minorities. You want to see other well-adjusted minorities? Look at the Jews. They live very well. They have a life. They're in our army. We, we appreciate them. We love the other. We're into the other. If we, and we have Arabs, Bedouins, who serve in our army. We like the other. We want them to live with us. But don't be seditious. Be seditious, we can't grant you those rights. In fact, we've got to de-grant you rights. Okay? <laughs> so that's option number three. There's another two options I'll discuss very quickly. One is Mordecai uh, Kedar. He says create cantons. Professor Kedar in Bar he says create cantons uh, for the big Arab cities, let them rule themselves. They, 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 he calls it like a United Arab Emirates in Israel. Let the big cities be ruled by Arabs, but, the, but as a kind of autonomy within and the next Israel. And finally, just I say this for the point of logic, because I once spoke to liberal professors from New York City, and I didn't mention this point, and then a, a liberal professor said to me, how I didn't you mention this point, which is just exchange of population. Which is, look, if we can't, if we can't, uh, right, it's very unpopular today. I'm using it only for the sake of logic to show you that there's different spectrums being, being discussed, being different ideas within the spectrum being discussed. And that is, look, Jews, about 800,000 Jews were kicked out of the Arab countries, and we say, exchange of populations, go to your Arab countries, find self-determination, unless you want to live within our country and accept the fact that we have a right to live there. But if you, if the Chinese people in China, <coughs> if the Chinese people down in Chinatown, in New York City, started demanding that now this is part of mainland China, that would be sedition, right? I have no problem with their culture. I have no problem with Palestinian, Arab, or Muslim culture in my land. But don't try to undermine the sovereignty of the state of Israel. So those are five different options that are discussed. And you don't have to accept any of them. But accept that we need to open up the discussion and not shy away from it. 100%. And, and in top units. Uh, that is part of the ethos. Uh, the part of the ethos of Zionism was a return to the land, but also a return to Jewish self-defense, Jewish strength. <laughs> so they're not. So they're not. Something that every Texan understands, you know. So they're not claiming the uh, uh, the exemption exclusion or whatever. No, quite the opposite. They have an ideology of 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 being part of the defense of Israel, 
and, and loving the state as a mechanism for the fulfillment of the Jewish dream to come back to the land of Israel after 2,000 years. Yeah. There are many Arabs that want to actually converse with me and, and other people in the community. You know, I have a neighbor in where I live in the Mount of Olives who has basically signaled to me, don't shake my head in public. Not because he doesn't like me, because he likes me. It's because he's afraid that society is always looking, judging. And he's told me that either Fatah or Hamas has come to him and threatened him, or offered him money, or threatened him, one or the other. And basically, as I said before, jihad doesn't want to strike against Jews. It wants to strike, first and foremost, it strikes against tolerant Arabs, who say, you know what? These Jews aren't so bad after all. I like to live with my cousins next door. They have great hospitals, great roads, great everything. You know what? My wife wears a burqa book and she, she can still learn to drive. That makes life so much easier. Maybe living with the Jews isn't so bad after all. Uh, but the, the jihad is very intolerant. And the problem with the jihad is it's also very violent. It's not that it's intolerant because it really doesn't like your ideas. It'll take you out if you voice those ideas. You know what, I'll, I'll take that correction and I'll explain to you my rationale. I don't want to say the word Arabs, because there's many kinds of Arabs. And it's just not true. As I explained in the beginning, jihad is a type of ideology. And I want to explain that jihadism, that kind of supremacism, is an ideology that's rampant. And it's going through Facebook like, like, like wildfire. You're absolutely right that the Palestinian Authority is the gateway drug to jihadism today. They are themselves inciters uh, to, to the message to destroy the Jews. And nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to say face on, hey, these guys that are getting millions of dollars from the United States of America and also from Israel are really, really bad guys who are really sending young people to their death, who are, who are really destroying any chance that this next generation of young Arabs is going to have a chance to see the Jew as their colleague, their friend, their potential peace partner, even a cold peace. Because they're really being taught from the youngest age the most virulent neo-Nazi ideology. It's, it's, it's so sad that young girl, that beautiful young girl, who had enough chance to go to college and to do whatever she wanted to, become in Israel, as you know, Arabs, our Supreme Court justices and Knesset members and so on. Uh, she had that opportunity and she gave it up. And, uh, and that's because of the PA's incitement. No, I've given a few different arguments, right? I've given the argument of it's, it's a historical connection. Also, alternatives to actually make lives better. You know, re real... The, 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 the peace movement today, the serious peace movement today, is actually focusing on conversing with the settlers, getting uh, <coughs> religious leaders on their side and the settlers to talk, because they're the people who are serious about holding onto the land, so let's somehow uh, come to conversation. With regard to media, to, to media strategy, or, or, or we've been derelict. We've been derelict about it, and, and we've fallen behind. And the, 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 there's, a, there's a problem in facing some of the lies. I'll do a little exercise with you, okay? You're, we're living in, in medieval times. You're a young father in medieval France, Jewish France, a Jewish medieval, a Jewish ghetto, okay? And a young Christian boy somehow wanders into your uh, ghetto, Jewish ghetto, what, and he's lost. What do you do? The answer is, you give him some water, and you help him find his mom and dad, right? But imagine the next day you're walking, and you see a big poster that says, the Jews murdered little Christopher and it made monster out of him. Well, how do you answer that? <laughs> it's like, it's so out of our, we don't even know how to answer that because it's so, no, I didn't kill him and make monster out of him. Right? The, the lies are so egregious and recurring that we, we're facing a world and we're facing a UNESCO, which is a serious, with tie, Organization. We need attention. Huh? We need to need attention. And whatever, it, whatever it is, it's, it's not anything. Maybe she was, uh, she was influenced by the 22 Arab countries. She said it because I know her. She's from Bulgaria. Right. You know, she doesn't know. She may not know. I, I never uh, 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 impute ignorance on people who want to no. completely destroy our history. I say there's, it's more an active role than that. But okay. My, my bottom line too is, is that there's an awakening now that we have to fight the narrative war. We have been good at the other wars. We've been good at the defensive physical war. We've managed. The economic wars against Israel, we've managed. The legal wars against Israel, we've managed. Even, even the demographic war, we've managed more or less. When I was born, there was 3 million Jews in Israel. Now there are 6 million Jews in Israel. So we've managed. 
explain the narrative where we've been derelict and we're behind. I guess why, that's why I'm standing before you today, in part, to, to, help, to help fight that battle. So, um, look, I tried to offer you a hopeful line that it could be separated. Uh, I do think that uh, right now jihadism is causing a destruction of that civilization. I think there's going to be people that realize that they don't want to see Aleppo. You know what Aleppo is? Sure. One of the oldest inhabited places uh, on, on the globe. And it's, it's wrecked. It's totally wrecked. Somebody's going to have to wake up and say, enough of this. We don't want to see our whole society, our whole civilization be destroyed. But if not, let me tell you about Israel. We have our hand out for peace. But if you mess with us, we're ready for war. Yeah. And we always will be ready for war. And that's, that's the whole ethos of never again. We need to say, I myself carry a pistol, but I'm not, I'm not a warlike person, but if you mess with me, we, we, we will absolutely, we've become not only good at defending ourselves, but our, our, our self-defense capabilities, physical, technological, and other, is world-renowned. And the world is interested in it. So my point to you is, is that we can do both. If you, what you said was going, God forbid, let's say it goes that way, then okay. Well, I'm not going anywhere. Right. What do you think? Are <laughs> 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 we independent? We have a good relationship with the Kurds. We want to see them have. Uh, I'm not talking policy now. This is this is already like uh, this is outside of our realm, and I'm certainly not a spokesman for the state of Israel in general. Uh, but in general, we'd like to see minorities that are fighting for their independence, certainly the biggest minority in the world, I think, that doesn't have their own state, uh, be successful. We've had a great relationship. I have spoken to many Jews of Kurdish areas from a long time ago. You speak to, to, to Jews that have been in the Middle East that have faced many kinds of pogroms. But then the relationship that the Jews and the Kurds have had has been, I've never heard and I've never read of any uh, problems. We have a lot of respect for one another. Um, I guess that's all I can really say in this venue. And I wish you lots of luck. We're praying for, for, uh, for the horrible wars that are to our north uh, to end soon. There's been, and maybe the world should also uh, give more attention to the maybe 500,000 people that have died in Syria, the millions that are displaced, and let Israel be strong, because if Israel is strong, it'll bring more stability to the nation. I want you to understand that in the net, we believe that Israel is the eastern outpost of Western democratic values, mm -hmm. and the settlers are really holding them. <coughs> these demonized people who really have, every time they go to work, they take their lives in their hands. And these people are holding down the fort for all of Western civilization. If, God forbid, an Israeli government decides to give up the Judean scenario in the West Bank, if you will, Israel will be nine miles long, and it's um, now as part of its waste. And any, any airplane you know, could be shot at by a missile from Calcilia, which is so close to Ben Gurion Airport. So these people are really the outpost, and they've been demonized um, throughout the media in the Western world, and they're really, really doing all of us a great, great service. Thank you so much. Thank you.